I'd like to say welcome to everyone and appreciate the opportunity to stand up here and endeavor to present a lesson. I certainly don't claim to be a preacher or an evangelist or one who is very talented as far as speaking. But if you can ignore the inexperience and inability of the speaker or the messenger, perhaps you can get something from the message itself. There is in, in your bulletin uh, an outline kind of the lesson we're going to be dealing with this morning, the indestructibility of the church. The church has been described in many different ways as essential. Certainly it is very essential for us. It's been described as all sufficient. All of our spiritual needs are met within the church. So it is indeed all sufficient. It's been described as perpetually relevant. It's just as relevant today as it was in the days that it was written. Our emotional and spiritual needs have not changed since that time. But I want to talk this morning about another characteristic of the church that perhaps we don't think about often enough is the indestructibility of the church. It's obvious that there's no material thing in this world that's permanent. Everything that we see and everything about us, the world itself is contingent. It's contingent on God continuing to supply that power that keeps it going. So no material thing is permanent. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 6 speaks of the everlasting mountains and the perpetual hills. And th those things will last as long as the earth does. In that sense, they are indeed everlasting or perpetual. Yet the psalmist could envision the earth being removed, the mountains being shaken. Psalms 46 and verse 2. Ancient Rome was referred to as the eternal city thought by its citizens to be indestructible. It's been gone for many hundreds of years. Ancient empires such as the Babylonian Empire were thought to be invincible and enduring. All of them, and it is gone at this time. History, however, has unequivocally demonstrated that no city, no nation, no civilization can make, the good, good, make good the claim of real permanency. This nation which we live, which we love, this United States, is no doubt destined to follow that same historical path. At some point in time, it probably will no longer exist if history tells us, if we believe history. Material things of this world are, as we say, here today and gone tomorrow. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. The passing and changing of material things teaches us that our bodies, being material, are also not permanent. Think of David's prayer in Psalms chapter 39, verse 4 through 5. Lord, make me to know mine end, and to measure my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age as nothing before thee. 1 Peter 1, verse 24, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth away. James says that our life is like a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. In view of the obvious certainty of change and decay, man has always longed for something permanent and indestructible. Even Abraham in the long ago recognized that he was but a stranger and an exile or a sojourner, sojourner on earth. Hebrews 11 verse 10 says, He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The durability and the lasting quality of a structure is determined by the, its foundation and by the skill of its builder. And God is the builder of our church. Certainly it is durable and has been constructed skillfully. This city with foundations, this permanent homeland, which Abraham and others of like faith sought, is the eternal kingdom of Christ, of which all Christians are citizens. This is the only kingdom the world has ever known that is indestructible, everlasting, permanent, and unshakable. 
It's comforting to know that while so much of what we know will cease to exist, there are things which will continue eternally. Christ says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35. 1 Peter 1, verses 23 and 25 read, birth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The word of God is the seed of the kingdom, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. As long as you have viable seed, the original can be reconstructed. Man's flesh ages, weakens, and finally returns to the dust of the ground. But our spirits are eternal, returning to God who gave them, to be assigned to one of two possible eternal destinies. The one a source of indescribable joy, the other a source of indescribable sorrow and pain. Our earthly families even have lack any real permanence. Children become parents. Parents become grandparents. Grandparents become great-grandparents. And the original, and this continues until the original is no more. Separation in this life takes place. If you're like me, you don't remember your great-great-great-grandma parents. You probably don't even know what their names were. So families, in a physical sense, go out of existence. But our spiritual family, the church, is eternal. When our days on this earth have ended, we go to join those of our spiritual family who have preceded us. And the spiritual separation is only temporary. Relationships change. Uh, Christ says we're not given in marriage in that lot, that eternity. But the, the family stays the same. Our spiritual family is eternal. The church will last in its earthly form as long as this earth exists in the end. And at the end of time, we'll continue as God's family in his heavenly home. It's indestructible in this age and, and also in the one that's to come in eternity. You know, we worry a great deal about false teachers. I often hear that, that the church can disappear within one generation. We, hear about, we worry about indifference and worldliness in the church. And, and, and that's right that we should do so. But these things will never destroy the church. They may cause apostasy of a local congregation, but they will never destroy the church. They may cause individuals to lose their faith, but it will never destroy the church. God made the church, and only God can bring it to an end. I do not fear the church's destruction. It's like the anvil that wears out many of the blacksmith's hammers, hammer after hammer, meets its end, but the anvil is still there. The church will be here after those who have sought its destruction, either from within the church or without, are long gone. We've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Why am I so confident? I'm confident because of history, the unsuccessful efforts in the past to destroy the church, and because, secondly, and maybe more importantly, because the prophets have, because of the prophecies contained in God's Word. God's Word claims indestructibility for the church. Belief in the Scriptures is belief in the indestructibility of the church. The inspired Old Testament, Old Testament prophets foretold the establishment of an everlasting kingdom. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The church will continue to increase or to be populated until the end of time. It will go on making Christians forever, as long as this world lasts. Daniel, another prophecy, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. In the fullness of time, as these prophecies indicated, Christ came to establish this everlasting kingdom. In his conversation with his apostles at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said to Peter, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of an ancient walled city represented its strength. No city was stronger than its gates. The gates of hell, or more properly Hades, the abode of the dead, could not hold Christ. He rose from the grave, passing through the gates of Hades, and established his church. Even the power of death and the grave could not prevail over the church, over Christ and the church. The kingdom of Christ will not be overcome or destroyed or shaken. It will stand forever. The indestructible kingdom is, is the church of Christ. It's not a building. It's not a denomination or a group of denominations. It's not a local congregation of Christians. Buildings decay, congregations may die, and denominations certainly are not permanent, but the church will never be destroyed. It's God saved, his redeemed, it's his family on earth, and he will not allow its destruction. Any power capable of destroying the church must overcome the power of God, and who or what can do that? Is there any man who lives or has ever lived who can destroy God's kingdom? Man can kill other men, he can pollute and ruin his environment, but he's not capable of annihilating the church of God. One might say that Satan has great power, and he does. Can he not destroy the church? Sin and Satan and sin possess great power of destruction. Satan can destroy one's character or usefulness, and even one's soul in hell. Satan may be said to be a destroyer of all that is good and holy. But though his power is great, Satan is not omnipotent or all-powerful. There is a greater power. Sin in the form of immortality or immorality, unbelief, and indifference can hurt and harm God's church deeply. This is undeniable. But thanks be to God, sin is not sufficiently powerful to demolish the church. The power of God and the power of good is stronger than the power of Satan and the power of sin. Some would scoff at the idea of the indestructibility of the church and point to that period known as the Dark Ages and assert that the church went out of existence during this time. Some have spent much effort and time and expense endeavoring to show that such was not the case. A man by the name of Dr. Hans Grimm in a booklet entitled Tradition and History of the Early Churches of Christ in Central Europe, published by the Firm Foundation, traces the history of the church showing its continuous existence from Pentecost until the present. He concludes as follows. There has always been a real church of Christ in this world since Pentecost. And this means a church believing in faith, repentance, confession, and immersion for the remission of sins. A church which worshipped at least the first day of the week with hymns, prayers, the Lord's Supper, Bible study, and contributions. A church which worked under the oversight of bishops or pastors, deacons, and evangelists. A church, not some isolated servers, Seekers, rather, but an organized church which trusted in the Lord's promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He mentioned many places and times where the church can be shown to have existed. All this is kind of interesting and has some measure of relevance to the question that we're discussing this morning. However, even if we in this century could not give evidence for the continued existence of the church, this would not mean that it did not exist. 
We not see the sun at night, but it still exists. In the Arctic region, it cannot be seen for six months, but it still exists. If in no other way, the church has existed and will continue to exist in a latent sort of a way. In, the, in the God's Word. As long as God's Word, the Bible exists, then in a latent sort of way, the church existed, exists. When God's Word is read and obeyed, the church will exist. There have been massive, massive efforts in the past to destroy the church. Probably no other organization has withstood so many and such powerful assaults against it. Herod the Great tried to destroy Christ himself by killing all the, ch the babies in Jerusalem. In his hometown of Nazareth, the people took Jesus to the crest of the hill, intending to throw him down to his death, and he managed to escape. The rulers of the Jews sought for some time to put Jesus to death and finally did so. Jesus, however, rose from the grave and foiled Satan's destructive plan. Satan didn't give up, for after the church was established, persecution began. First, the Jews sought to destroy the church, and we read that history in the book of Acts. Second, the power of Rome was turned against the Christians, and they were tortured and killed in every conceivable way. They were beaten, thrust through with the sword, burned at the stake, and eaten by beasts. If the, king could not destroy, if the king could not be destroyed, perhaps his subjects could be annihilated. Blood of martyrs, however, proved to be the seed of the kingdom. The kingdom was indestructible. Efforts have continued over the centuries by very powerful governments and agencies to annihilate the Bible, to annihilate Christians and the church. The kingdom has remained and will continue. Efforts continue today to destroy the church. Satan works through atheism, gross immorality. We see that all around us today, and infidelity. He will never give up, nor will he ever fail to find willing agents to assist in his efforts to destroy the church. We can extract in the future strong opposition in difficult times, but we can also expect victory. The Lord's power is great and his promises are certain. Because, because the church is divine in origin, it's eternal in duration. In announcing the birth of Jesus, the angel Gabriel said, He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. The psalmist had declared long before, Thy throne of God is forever and ever. The church is indestructible then because its creator is omnipotent or all-powerful. Its head is a victor over death and the grave. Its members are citizens of heaven, not just of this earth, children of God. Its constitution is the Bible, which certainly has proven its indestructibility. What power or what combination of a power can accomplish the destruction of the church? What should be our attitude toward the indestructibility of the church? What does it tell us? What, how do we react to that? Hebrews 12 verse 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. <clears throat> the Revised Standard Version says, Let's be grateful for receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We have in Christianity and in the church something that's extremely rare, that which is permanent. We need to be thankful and we need to worship and serve, serve God acceptably. You know, patience and certainly our certainty are real encouragements to diligent and patient labor. One would not work for a company which was about to go under or, under or go bankrupt, or a government which was about to fail. We're working for something that has the greatest future possible, so it behooves us to be diligent. The pay not be, may not be so great today, but the retirement is very special. Man has always sought something better than decay, death, and destruction. You know, Sure, we've all read about the past searches for the fountain of youth who constantly on in Florida. 
Today's emphasis on scientific and medical searches for anti-aging methods and genetic cures indicate a man's desire for a longer life. Perhaps what we're really searching for can only be found in the indestructibility of Christ's family, the church. If you're not a part of that church, you can be a part of that family. It's a very simple process. We must have faith in God. We must be willing to express that faith that we believe in God, that we believe that Jesus is God's Son. We must express that faith to others. We must commit to having God's Word guide our lives, our thoughts, and our behavior. That's called repentance. We must submit to immersion in water. That's called baptism for the forgiveness of our past sin. This process allows God to apply the cleansing, forgiving power of Christ's blood to our lives. It allows him to add us to his church, his body. You know, if you've been through that process, but you've drifted away, we can pray with you and for you. And God will restore that relationship from which you drifted. We've selected a song to sing and encourage you to come as we stand and sing. <clears throat>